Hello and welcome to Edelwarn Palace Estate. The map I'm just handing out... There you go. You're welcome. Please pass the rest of those around for me, would you? Thanks ever so much. Now, where was I? Yes. The map James was kind enough to pass around shows the entire grounds of the estate. The bus is parked just here at the entrance gate to the estate, where the two guards are standing either side. See? We'll make our way in on foot, as no public vehicles are allowed beyond this point. We're going to head straight up the main road towards the palace itself, and on our way there, we'll stop to have a look around the gallery, which is about halfway up. You see it there on your map, I'm sure. Then onwards to the palace, and we'll watch the changing of the guards. As the off-duty guardsmen make their way back to the residence of the guards, so too will we, by following the road just right of the palace on your map. The residence is on the corner, just before you come to the maze. We're privileged in that the guards have kindly opened up their doors to us, so we can get an insight into how they live. After we spend about half an hour there, it's off to the maze we go where we might spend a good deal longer. Well, where some of us might, anyway. Opposite the maze, on the other side of the road, down a lane leading off the main road, is a delightful animal sanctuary. Oh, I do beg your pardon. That's not the animal sanctuary at all, but the archery range. Yes, uh, the archery range. And we'll stop there next. Most of the sports and activities are on the other side of the estate. See, you have river fishing, the cricket pitch, and the golf course over there. That's the golf club, by the way, at the end of the lane. We'll be lunching there a little later this afternoon. It's a beautiful area overlooking the forest and lake, and you can see the golf course itself right beside it. But back to the archery range now, and on from there we'll be stopping off at the observatory which is more than 100 years old. It's on the way back to the main gate just after the animal sanctuary. Yes, there's the animal sanctuary and the birds of prey exhibit, which is unfortunately closed at present. We might take in the animal sanctuary after lunch if we've time, but I think we'll avoid the petting zoo, which is up that lane towards where the deer graze. Now, on our way to lunch at the golf club, we'll cross over the main road to the opposite side to the observatory and visit the botanical gardens. I think you'll agree that by lunchtime we'll certainly have worked up a hunger. Don't worry, it's only a short walk from the botanic gardens up the lane to the golf club. No more than five minutes, I'd say. Now, after lunch, you'll have a choice of activities. Should you want to play golf, there's the nine-hole par three course, which is good for intermediate players who have some experience. But I strongly recommend the pitch and putt course for the complete novices among you. If golf isn't your cup of tea, you could partake in a game of cricket. Designed for people of all fitness and ability levels, our cricket matches are all about fun and having a good time. Please don't take it too seriously. I guarantee first-timers will love it. For those of you who just want to relax and let the world pass you by, you can come fly fishing with our expert fisherman, John, though only if you have been fishing before. And depending on how long we spend doing activities, as I said before, we may or may not have time to visit the animal sanctuary after lunch too. For those of you who are less than keen on sports, however, and determined to see the animals, you can go there straight away and spend the afternoon in the company of some furry friends. Your final alternative is a cruise on the lake. The boat takes you on a journey all around the circumference and then back to the northeastern side, where you can don your togs and take a dip in a specially heated section designed to make swimming there as pleasant and relaxing an experience as possible for you. Thank you for coming along today. 
Archaeology has been my life's work, and it is an honor to be able to share that which I love with the wider public, and to hopefully instill a similar passion in some of you here today, and who knows, maybe inspire the next generation of archaeologists. Now, if you have researched my background, you will know that for most of my career I have worked in Egypt. So, unsurprisingly, it is a little bit of Egyptian magic that I want to share with you today. Look at the screen above me here. What you see is one of the most awe-inspiring sights in the world. It is, of course, the Great Pyramid of Giza, or at least a diagram thereof. Let me first take you on a little walk through the pyramid to show you what it contains. Leading down the passageway from the entrance takes you to the subterranean chamber. Now, for any of you taking notes, let me spell that. Subterranean. S-U-B-T-E-R-R-A-N-E-A-N. -E -E Spelling has always been a weakness of mine, too, so never mind. Now, no one really knows what this was meant to be, but some speculate that the king may have originally built this burial tomb here and then changed his mind. If we wander back up towards the entranceway and then take two lefts, we find ourselves in another chamber, almost directly above the subterranean one. This is called the Queen's Chamber but not as its name suggests, because it was the burial place of the queen. In fact, many Egyptologists believe this chamber housed the pharaoh's spirit. If we wander back out of the queen's chamber, we re-enter the main passageway in an area where it gets considerably wider. This widened passage is the Grand Gallery thought to have been built as a glorious entranceway to the king's tomb. Uh, have any of you noticed the three smaller passageways here? Here and, and here. Uh, two of them leading out of the upper sections of the pyramid. These are not, in fact, passageways at all, but rather air shafts that were necessary to maintain a supply of oxygen for slave workers as the building work was going on. Two of the air shafts lead into the signature room of the structure, the king's chamber. It was inside this tower-shaped room that the pharaoh's body was laid to rest. Magnificent, isn't it? Such an amazing feat of engineering, and to think that it's more than five thousand years old. It's hard for us today to appreciate just how much of an achievement it was to build a construction of this kind so long ago. But to put it in perspective a little, bear in mind that the Egyptians had no motorized equipment, no computers to make difficult calculations as to the structural integrity of the building, no lorries or trucks to transport building materials, etc., they relied to a large extent on hand-held tools, and the harnessed power of animals, and indeed other human beings, namely their slaves. An estimated 2.3 million blocks of limestone are believed to have gone into the building. These giant slabs were, it is thought, sourced from nearby quarries. Some of the Torah limestone used had to be transported across the Nile. But getting the limestone to the building site was a piece of cake compared to the task of transporting the estimated 80-ton granite slabs used in the king's chamber there. After all, these came from the town of Aswan, some 500 miles away. In total, it is believed that eight thousand tons of granite from Aswan, 5.5 million tons of limestone, and 500,000 tons of mortar were used in the construction. The ingenuity of the ancient Egyptians was demonstrated time and time again. In response to the challenge of having to somehow cut the giant slabs of limestone and granite, 
The Egyptians devised a novel method which involved hammering wooden wedges into the stone. Water was then poured onto the wedges until they were completely soaked. As the wedges absorbed the water, they expanded, causing cracks to form in the rock as they did so, effectively cutting the slabs into pieces for the Egyptians. At completion of the main structure, white casing stones were added. Sadly, little evidence remains of these, and we can only imagine how beautiful the pyramid must have looked with this white façade adorning it. A massive earthquake which struck in A.D. 1300 loosened most of the outer casing stones, and these were removed at the wishes of the then-ruling Bahri Sultan, who wanted them reused to build mosques and fortresses in Cairo. In fact, many of the original casing stones can still be seen on structures around the city today. The precise manner in which the pyramid was constructed is still not known. Various theories suggest the huge slabs of stone were either pulled, dragged, lifted, or even rolled into place. Indeed, due to recent findings, some have also begun to question the notion that slave labor was used at all. This notion was first put forward by the Greeks thousands of years ago, and has remained popular ever since. But archaeologists have recently discovered evidence of huge workers' camps, which seem to suggest that the building may have been undertaken by armies of highly skilled workers rather than slaves. One Egyptologist, Werner, posited that the huge numbers of highly skilled workers were organized into a hierarchy consisting of two gangs, each of about 100,000 men. According to Werner, the gangs were further divided into five groups of tribes of 20,000 men according to their skills. What is certain is that Now, if I can have everyone's attention a moment, I have some announcements to make. First of all, we've just received the results for 2011 from Head Office, and I want to congratulate all of you for another highly successful year. Once again, the online sales department has outperformed the rest of the company. This literally wouldn't have been possible without you. Sadly, after taking a hit in the stock markets, our investment arm investment traders, is down at the bottom of the pile. But then these are hard times for the stock markets, and a poorer than normal performance was to be expected. A little more surprising is how well the retail sales department did. Indeed, if it continues to perform like this, it will threaten the second most profitable arm of the business, design. But for the moment, it must content itself with third place. As for profits in the wholesale division, well, they've stayed pretty static at around £500,000. Overall, the message coming down from head office is, keep up the good work. Now, I have some more important news from head office. It has just been confirmed that we are moving down to the headquarters building on Cavendish Way. The move will take place on Monday. I'm handing you out a floor plan of our new office. Take a look at it, and we'll go through it together. As you can see, it's a little different to where we are at the moment, but I'm sure it'll feel like home in next to no time. Notice the fire escapes. Very important from a health and safety perspective. Either side of the floor. These are only to be used in exceptional circumstances. There are two main entrances at either end of the floor, which staff can use on a regular basis. Now, Tina, your customer service team is going to be placed in the open plan area to the right, just behind the fire escape. There are three different semi-open cubicles, all allocated to your department, so divide your guys up as you wish into teams. On the other side of the floor, near the left fire escape, there is a cubicle allocated to each of the legal, human resource and sales teams. Sales, you guys, will be nearest the fire escape. HR in the middle, legal at the other end. Okay, 
Now, Frank, my assistant manager, will be behind you guys at the back in the left corner office. I'll be opposite him in the other corner office. Moving to the front of the floor now, well, starting from the front entrance, nearest to you on the plan, on the left-hand side, we've got the finance team, and above them, marketing. On the other side, we've got the research guys opposite marketing, and closest to the door, that is going to be our new conference room. So guys, all I can say to you is, try to settle in on Monday morning. Welcome to headquarters. It is encouraging to see so many students here after hours to attend what is an optional lecture. I am very heartened. Thank you all for coming. Today's lecture is about bringing what you have learnt to life, or at least showing you how to bring it to life, or put it into practice. If you are truly passionate about archaeology, you will not wait until your first official dig or field trip with the university to get started. Why? Because it is so easy to do one yourself. Every weekend, each and every one of you can be going out scouting the land for potential dig sites and conducting your own amateur digs to gain what would be priceless on-site experience, which will stand to you if and when you qualify. So, my goal for today is to show you what you need to do. And it is really quite simple. So, let's start with the obvious. First of all, you have to identify a suitable dig site. The best way to go about doing this is by surface collecting, or walking around an area looking for things out of the ordinary. Ideally, you'll look to find a midden, that is M-I-D-D-E-N, an archaic term for a refuse site. Remember, dumps are a feature of modern existence. But in the near and distant past, people would simply dig a random hole and designate it as the spot to throw rubbish in. And that's your midden. Alternatively, if your surface collecting doesn't yield many finds, consider asking the local people of the area what they know. Sites are often found by word of mouth. Or if that doesn't work, use the state files. Remember, they are normally only ever open to qualified archaeologists, so you, the students of UCD, are in a very privileged position indeed to be able to access them. Now, once you have found a site with some potential and collected some surface finds, it's time to evaluate what you have collected. The objective is to identify the area of your prospective dig site which was the most densely populated, as this will yield the best results come dig time. Clean and categorise each surface artefact you find. Separate the modern trash, the unidentifiable items, the ceramics, the bone and shell tools, etc., and then begin the process of cleaning the finds you think are important. Use plain water as washing detergents can damage delicate pieces and cause etchings and the like to vanish. A soft brush will remove encrusted mud from any crevices quite effectively too, so please avoid scratching or picking at finds for obvious reasons. Now, having done this groundwork, you should be in a position to pinpoint the area which is likely to produce the best results, and therefore ready to start your dig. Borrow equipment from the faculty here if you do not have the right tools at home. We are always happy to assist students who show an interest in conducting archaeological work in their free time. You will need a trowel, flat blade shovel, dust pans, assorted brushes, measuring tape, folding sticks, plastic bags in assorted sizes, markers, a clipboard, line level, string, stakes, gloves, and fluorescent survey tape, and most important of all, a screen. You can make a DIY box screen pretty handily. You'll need four planks of wood, cut to measure, either to fit together as a square or rectangular box. 
Make the box frame out of these using L brackets. Attach a one quarter inch mesh frame to the base of the box using heavy duty staples or nails. If you are going to sift by hand, then design your box to two foot by four foot dimensions. A, because it is easier to handle and B, because it will fit neatly on your table. If you plan on fabricating a larger sifting device, then I would recommend a six foot by four foot screen. That's quite big enough. Now, with your tools in hand, it is time to start the dig proper. Firstly, you will need to dig a pit. I'd caution against the temptation to dig a very small one, say a one by one. Why? Simply because you'll be getting in your own way as your dig progresses. A two by three or three by four should give you enough room to work in. Place a stake and an eye hook at each corner of the pit and pull some string or cord through each stake to keep the edges of the pit clearly defined. Let's break here for five minutes to... We've looked at your proposal and while we are relatively happy with it and prepared to give you the go-ahead to get the project started, that is only on condition that you make some modifications to the original plans. First of all, having two car parks is all well and good, but you only have a ticket office in one of them. What happens if a customer encounters a problem in car park two? Does he have to go all the way over to car park one to get help? That'll have to change. Another issue we have is the location of one shopping outlet in isolation on the opposite side of the road to the main complex. I'm referring to the designer boutique by the roundabout. It's highly dangerous to expect people to cross over the road there. An accident waiting to happen, quite frankly. We very much approve of the placement of a flower bed in the centre of the complex and, of course, it makes sense to have this leading into the garden centre, as you have shown in your plans. That said, we're not sure a garden centre is the right kind of store for this location, and we would like you to carry out some further market research to provide evidence that there would be a demand for gardening products where such an outlet to be built. Also, the building in the main complex near to Car Park 2 is the Cineplex Cinema. That's fine, but we have a big issue with the placement of the cloakroom and toilets in a separate building. There's no logic for that, for goodness sake. What's more, the toilets are on the garden centre side of the building, which means they're even further away from the Cineplex. The only reason we could think of for laying out your plans in this manner is so that toilet users would be forced to walk through the electrical store in the middle of that building. Not acceptable. The Cineplex must have its own toilets. Other than that, we are fairly happy with your proposal and welcome the fact that your company is eager to invest in our town. We are willing to give the proposal conditional approval today. Conditional? on the changes I have just outlined being made prior to the commencement of building work. At the next town planners meeting, please present your revised plans and the council will then grant the go-ahead for work to begin. As regards your application for grant aid, the council has rubber-stamped funding of £1.3 million, which is £0.3 million in excess of the amount you applied for. This is a gesture of goodwill on the part of the Council to show you that we are very supportive of your bid to build the Knightsbridge complex here in Newsworth. Of course, the grant aid has some conditions attached to it. First of all, if your business does not remain in operation for five years, the grant should be repaid in full. If your business closes within 10 years, half the grant must be refunded. If your business shuts after the 10th and within the first 15 years of operation, you will be expected to return one quarter of the grant aid. Secondly, you will be required to employ local people 
to work at the centre where at all possible. Of the 500 employees, 75% should come from within five miles of Newsworth, and the other 25% should be within a 25 mile radius of the town. Only under exceptional circumstances and with the formal approval of the council can you employ someone who does not fit the criteria I have just outlined. Now, um... Is anyone familiar with the term parapraxis? Well, by the looks on your faces, I can surmise that you are not. Or that at least if you are, you are not aware of the fact. In actual fact, I am very confident that all of you have come across parapraxis before but you may recognise it by its more familiar name, a Freudian slip. A Freudian slip is an error in speech, memory or physical action, which can be interpreted as having occurred on account of some repressed or subconscious wish, conflict or train of thought. Some would pass off these glitches in our speech as slips of the tongue. But in psychoanalysis, a discipline founded by none other than Freud himself whose name, of course, has lent itself to the term here described, they take on much more significance, and indeed can often give an insight into the speaker's deepest and most suppressed inner thoughts. There is a common misconception, however, that all slips of the tongue can be interpreted as Freudian. In actual fact, for a Freudian slip to have occurred, the speaker must not consciously be aware that they were thinking or feeling the things that the slip revealed. For example, if a man is in love with a woman he knows, but has never told her, and in conversation, when asked by the woman whether he would like to accompany her to a movie, he replies, I would love you, as opposed to, I would love to. This is not a Freudian slip. Why? Because the man is consciously aware of his feelings for the woman. They are secret from her but not from him. For a slip to be truly Freudian, the feelings must be secret from the speaker as well as the person being spoken to. In other words, the speaker must not consciously be aware of how he feels. Freud believed passionately in the notion that nothing happened by chance and that the numerous little slips of one sort or another that people make in their speech could be interpreted to reveal something useful in psychoanalytical terms, about the speaker. He was convinced, in the particular case of Freudian slips, that they revealed the presence of restrained or repressed intentions. Freud held a similar view of dreams, and indeed is probably most famous for his work on dream analysis. However, the Freudian viewpoint is not without its sceptics. Many cognitive psychologists argue that slips of the tongue can be explained away for a much more simple reason. They are linguistic slips which result on account of poor attention to detail, insufficient knowledge, incomplete sense data and so on. Another explanation they give for such slips is the influence of locally appropriate response patterns that are strongly primed on account of recent activation or prior usage. That is, we sometimes use the wrong words because they are close to the forefront of our thoughts, having already been used very recently, or having been used in a similar but slightly different context before. Linguists support this view, and also point out that some sentences and phrases even lend themselves to error on account of the fact that they contain archaic or very old and rarely used words, or unusual expressions with forms that can easily be mixed up, and confused. They argue, therefore, that such slips are down to strong habit substitution. In other words, we commonly replace unfamiliar words and phrases with words and phrases that sound similar or that are close in meaning, but which may, in the particular context in which they are spoken, not make adequate substitutes for the replaced words or phrases. What is clear is that No, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to this meeting. Demand for membership places has far exceeded our expectations this year. 
So it was decided to gather you all here together to go through the process step by step. Once rather than many times with each of you individually. The first thing you need to do is not fill in the application form. This, you see, is a waste of time unless you have found an application sponsor. Your sponsor must be an existing full member of the club. Now, once you have your sponsor, you should log on to our website and fill in and send through the membership form. You will be prompted to provide the relevant deposit at the same time as you submit your application. You may do so using any major debit or credit card. The next step is for you to attend a general meeting of the club. There are typically meetings held once a month. After the club meeting, you will then be required to wait a while in order for the club committee to examine and, if all is in order, approve your application. It may be necessary to ask you to come forward for an additional interview before approval is granted, depending on the circumstances. Now, once you have been approved, you are almost a member of the club. All you need to do then is pay the remaining balance of your membership fee. Having done this, you are officially a member of Blaine Row Golf Club. However, you cannot start to play in competitions until you have acquired your handicap. In order to do this, you must send in three cards. The committee will then issue you with a club handicap within seven days on the basis of how you performed in each of the three rounds you played. Now, I won't spend much more than a few minutes on this, but let's go through the different membership types uh, quickly now. Remember, all the information I'm about to give you and more is available on our website. The first category is Full Ordinary Member. Basically, this is a full membership that gives you full playing rights during competitions, and for casual golf as well. It costs £10,000 to become a full member, or alternatively, four installments of £2,500. Our next category is Associate. This is for a golfer who is already a member of a club, but wants to join ours too, while keeping his existing club as his main club. You have the same rights as a full member, but the cost is £9,000. I must remind you that there is a limited number of memberships of this kind available. Five-day members pay £5,000 to join and this payment can be put towards becoming a full member at a later date if you would like to upgrade your membership status. You enjoy full playing rights during casual play and can play in all weekday competitions. However, you cannot enter competitions at the weekend. Intermediate membership is open to golfers under the age of 25, and costs £1,800, as do the other remaining membership types, junior, senior, and overseas. If you are an intermediate member, you too have full playing rights for casual play. However, you can only play in competition if a full member of the club invites you to join him. Junior members are aged between 12 and 18. They enjoy restricted playing rights in casual playing time and are only allowed to play on Monday and Wednesday mornings. They can occasionally play in competitions, but the opportunities to play in this format are severely restricted. Senior members enjoy full rights at all times and overseas members can play on the course casually at any time, and can enter competitions if invited to do so by a full member of the club. Now, as to the questions of... Look at her, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't she beautiful? The Abyssinian is a natural breed of cat, 
which originated in Africa, or more specifically, what is now Ethiopia. Today it is found in much of the surrounding African continent, particularly Somalia. Its head is broad and moderately wedge-shaped, and it has relatively large pointed ears, like the specimen you can see here in front of you. It is typically a reddish colour, and is known for the unusual M-shaped marking, which often appears directly above the two eyes. See here. It has a medium-length coat, in a sort of ticked pattern, ticked being a term to describe when the hair gets progressively darker from root to tip. There you go, little fellow, well done. Now this gentleman, he is a male, I can assure you, is the Aegean. The Aegean is of Greek origin, as you might have guessed, and is thought to have come from the Cycladic Islands. It's considered to be the only native Greek breed of cats. It is one of the newest and therefore rarest cat breeds, but relatively plentiful throughout Greece. It is much liked for its intelligence and friendliness, and because it excels in pest control. It has a semi-long-haired coat with rich tail. The coat is typically bi- or tricoloured, with white always present, and the other colours ranging from black to red, blue cream, etc. These colours are just as likely to present themselves as stripes. This little guy, as you can see, has beautiful reddish-blue stripes running through a pale coat. The head is medium-sized and quite round. The ears have a wide base, rounded tips, and are covered by hairs. Now the Australian. Australians are still mainly confined to distribution in their homeland. Obviously Australia, though a number of catteries in the UK have started to breed them too. Look at those expressive eyes. The cat is a fine example of the breed, medium-sized and short-haired. Notice also the large round head. This breed is much loved for its tolerance of children and because it is very rarely inclined to scratch. Its coat is typically spotted or, as in the case of this little fellow, classic tabby style. Last but not least, we have the bobtail, another relatively new breed, like the Aegean and Australian. The bobtail first appeared in the 1960s in the United States the only country in which it has a significant distribution and is most notable for its stubby bobbed tail which is only something like one-third to one-half the length of a normal cat's tail. It is a very sturdy breed with rather shaggy and dense fur. Bob tails can have any colour fur and often have the appearance of a tabby. Unlike the other breeds we have discussed the bob tail is not natural it is said to be a result of the crossbreeding of a domestic tabby cat and a bobcat. Such is the careful breeding the cat has undergone that it comes in all colours. And there are also both long and short hair versions. If I had to recommend one of these breeds to you today, I would have to vouch for the Australian. After all, as all of us here are parents, we must surely agree that our children are our first consideration when it comes to purchasing a pet, what effect the animal will have on them, how will it react, etc. These are questions we all ask ourselves, and they are even more important when the child is very young. The Australian is simply unrivaled in the temperament department and is extremely unlikely to lose its composure and take a swipe at your child. That said, it is still a very rare breed in these parts, and as with all things in the world, rare equates to very expensive. So it may be beyond the price range some of you are prepared to pay. Surprisingly, perhaps, though the bobtail is part lynx or bobcat, as they say in the States, it doesn't appear to have inherited any of the wildcat's aggressiveness. And therefore, it makes an excellent second best as a pet you can allow to be around children. It is also considerably less expensive. The other two breeds we have talked about both make excellent house pets. However, hand on heart, I could not endorse either as a pet to have around young children. In my view, the child's safety is not something to gamble with. So, if you can afford the extra few quid to lay out for a bobtail, 
or better still, an Australian, do so, you won't regret it.